and it's not just about an adventure, of course, it has a deeper meaning. It's about the fight between the good and the evil. It's about hero, heroic uh, behavior. What is expected of a hero? Uh, heroic code. What are you supposed to do? Uh, what are the expectations in particular situations? So, um, what I thought we could do, uh, the picture here is uh, one of the Anglo-Saxon warriors, but these kinds of helmets were worn by, uh, as I mentioned, um, the, the happenings in Beowulf, they don't happen in England, they happen in continental Europe. The poem was written a few hundred years later after these happenings had taken place. Interestingly, of course, uh, this is not, uh, this, is, this is fiction, uh, but interestingly, the people who are depicted in the Beowulf poem, they were real people except Problem, except for Beowulf, uh, he was a pretty uh, magical person, um, but, uh, but his significance can be seen also by the, by the fact that culturally what, what the poem is, it's, it's a Christ, written by a Christian poet. You can see these references about, about God, uh, very often we'll look at those when you go over it, and uh, and it's yet it's written about pagan times. So uh, the um, the uh, Christianity came was introduced to England to the British Isles um, in the late sixth century, and um, at the time of the writing of the poem. Uh, Christianity had kind of swiped over the entire isles and, and it was ad adopted by the people there and the kings and so on. Uh, but the poem is about pagan times. So we have this interesting cultural dialogue there <laughs> between the poet who is a Christian poet and wants to emphasize certain certain Christian message here, but at the same time, the people are pretty much pagan. So, um, so you will will see how that works out. And uh, for today, um, I asked you to read, like in the syllabus, I have marked uh, reading the lines of one through seven hundred and nine. So um, pages um, all the way up to page 49. It seems like a lot of pages, but of course you're, you're like actively reading only every other page because every other page is the old English. And as I said, we'll occasionally go back to old English and, and you can kind of hear how it is, uh, how it sounds, and you can learn to, learn to read uh, old English a little bit. Uh, there are English courses where we just, you know, focus more on the history of English. But anyway, so I'm, I'm going to post this PowerPoint so you don't have to write down uh, anything. I'll post it on uh, Blackboard. But um, I want to talk about uh, talk about this uh, this theory of the myth a little bit here before we start actually reading the poem and and talking about it in detail. So uh, there was this uh, scholar uh, called Joseph Campbell um, in the you know previous century, and he he dis described he was a scholar of myths and folklore, and he noticed that you know when you read something like the grief tragedies or 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 this. This about the Greek gods, you will, and, and then you read, for instance, uh, fairy tales, and now we are reading Nordic myths, uh, we will notice that there are some patterns that keep occurring 
in these narratives. And they tend to be, if not universal, they have been shared from culture to culture. So if you read um, Greek mythology, if you read Indian, uh, Chinese, um, Russian fairy tales, German fairy tales, uh, which go back several centuries and, and then were collected in the 19th century by the Grimm brothers. You must have heard some Grimm fairy tales. Maybe your parents wanted to avoid those gruesome Grimm <laughs> fairy tales, but, but you can have grown up to be this age without having heard about uh, some of them. But anyway, what Campbell noticed that there is this, that there are these stages that very often these fairy tales, folk tales, and uh, myths uh, exhibit, they exemplify. So, uh, so there is, you can, you can divide what happens into the separation. You, there is this equilibrium uh, up there. There is a stable situation. People are living their lives as normally as possible, and then something happens and that changes the equilibrium. It, it, it uh, forces out the status quo and something needs to be done. So there is, uh, th th that leads to the separation. And if we have the hero there, the hero, Campbell's book, by the way, it was called The Hero with 1,000 Faces. And this is the adventure of the hero. So obviously in our Beowulf, Beowulf is our hero. And you will notice that some of these will apply to Beowulf, but some of them will not. So there is variation in how this happens, but this is kind of interesting to know anyway. So there's this call to adventure, and we will talk about that when we get to that point in the poem, that Beowulf is called to this adventure. What is the adventure? What happens? He hears about something which shakes the equilibrium, the, the st stability of his life. He hears about what is going on in Denmark among the Danes, and they are being threatened by this horrible monster whose name is Grendel, right? So Grendel comes every now night and eats uh, the Danish king's men, his soldiers, and uh, kills them and eats them. And, uh, and Beowulf is like, oh, that's horrible. I'm going to have to go and do something about it. So, uh, so he does. So there's this call to adventure. News have reached him, and he needs to. He wants to do something. Um, he doesn't refuse the call. In many of the myths of, you know, the myths of the world, there is the hero who is first really reluctant to do something about it. I don't want to leave my cozy little life here in the countryside where everything is peaceful and quiet and I live in this equilibrium. Uh, I don't want to go. Um, has anyone seen Lord of the Rings? Okay, all right, if you've seen Lord of the Rings, this is not a foreign book to you because a lot of this uh, comes from what, what Tolkien, who wrote the Lord of the Rings, the, the trilogy, on which the films are based. Has anyone read, by the way? It's great if you have, if you have watched it. It's a good weekend watching, you know. Uh, while you are reading Beowulf, so you can see the echoes. Tolkien was uh, the person in, in England who made Beowulf scholarship into interesting scholarship. Before that, it was just like these people who were interested in the old English language, they were just looking, looking at the language and trying to decipher uh, what it meant and, and write a grammar of it and so on and so forth. Look at the lexical variation and and all those uh, all those things that I find fascinating because my main thing is linguistics. But uh, the the people who uh, 
were interested in the story itself uh, were not so interested in. Tolkien came um, in the 1930s and he um, wrote uh, a, a, an article about Beowulf and said this is a great Anglo-Saxon poem which is worth reading uh, beyond the, its linguistic value. Of course, it's for, for ling linguists, which at that point were typically called philologists. It was fantastic because you've got all these language examples of a former stage of English, and now uh, you don't have to focus on that only. You can focus on the great story, and that's what was Tolkien's uh, contribution to kind of like summarize it in a very simplifying way. So Beowulf doesn't refuse the call. He's actually very enthusiastic about going. Supernatural aid, we'll see later on once we get a little bit further. We'll see what that supernatural aid was uh, for Beowulf. And uh, then there's the crossing of the threshold. And obviously, uh, once we get to uh, how, uh, how uh, Beowulf first uh, is able to kill Grendel, and then uh, that's not, of course, the story doesn't end there. There are three foes, three enemies that Beowulf needs to, needs to fight against and win before uh, the story ends. And uh, he manages with the two first ones very well. Grendel's mother is going to be the next one. In the next set of readings, you will be introduced to Grendel's mother. And uh, there is that threshold. We can, we can kind of call that probably the threshold for Beowulf because he goes to the bottom of the sea to fight Grendel's mother. And belly of the whale, of course, you know, at the bottom of the sea. Uh, you are familiar with the biblical story of Jonah, where, where the, the, uh, you know, the belly of the whale was that, that horrible place where, where um, you, know, you kind of come to a revelation. Um, road of trials, you have to conquer this and this and this, and we will see uh, much more of this in the other myths that we will be reading. The last one we will be reading uh, is the the national epic of Finland, and that's called the Kaleva. And there we have several incidents of the road of trials, the kinds of things these people have to conquer, like plow a field full of snakes, uh, for instance, and, uh, and then they can have what they want. Uh, meeting with the goddess, um, it's not part of Beowulf, really. A uh, woman as temptress, uh, if you uh, are familiar with uh, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, you have the sirens there who are women as temptresses, key figures. We don't have anything like that here in Beowulf. Uh, we will later on in the other some of the other stories. Uh, atonement with father, uh, Beowulf's dad is gone, he is dead already, so there is no uh, atonement here, but of course he is uh, thinking about his father, sometimes referred to as his father's son, and he is clearly wanting to make his father and his, his king happy for what he does. So there is that kind of a uh, father figure, but, but no reconciliation is really needed because everybody agrees that this is what Beowulf needs to do. Um, so we can skip some of these refusal of the return. There's none of that also, but there in some of the other stories you find that there is this, okay, you go on an adventure and then there's a problem coming back or you don't want to come back, and you're supposed to go back. Uh, magic flight, um, 
Beowulf tells of uh, some of these magic flights. This is not a this is not a big thing. Uh, rescue coming from outside, um, and then crossing the return threshold. In Beowulf's case, he's going back home after he kills Grendel and Grendel's mother. Um, and freedom to live is which returns back to the equilibrium, to the stability, to the status quo. Of course, it, it never lasts forever. Like in Beowulf's case, uh, in his old age, he has to fight the dragon. And that uh, starts this, this circle again. But uh, what I wanted, I, I wanted to show this to you so that you would kind of keep in mind that these stories that we read, they are not like prototypes of the hero's quest, um, the adventure of the hero. They don't show all of these uh, steps that, uh, that Campbell so you know, brilliantly um, explicated here. But uh, anyway, some of, them, some of them are. And so there's separation, initiation, and then return. Here's the, the same thing uh, going now clockwise, so there's call to adventure, they will hear about Grendel that is eating uh, the Danes and so he needs to go there. Supernatural aid, there is some um, feature of that in, in the story. Uh, threshold, uh, you will meet in our reading for today, there is a threshold when the when Beowulf and his men come from southern, what is now southern Sweden, to the land of the Yeats. And uh, that's Beowulf's tribe. Beowulf is a Yeat. And by the way, it's southern Sweden because you, know, you still have, you may have heard about Gothenburg. Um, one of the big towns in Sweden, southern Sweden. In Swedish, it's Göteborg. It's, uh, it's the uh, fortification of the Yeats. So, so we still have these uh, these um, Jutland, a place name also there. So these kind of um, very by the place names very by the was this tribe of which Beowulf came, even though he was not an historical figure. So there are the, the first threshold is when these Yeats come across the sea from southern Sweden, what is now southern Sweden, to Denmark. It's not a long sea trip. Uh, forget how many hours it took, like less than a day for, for Beowulf and his men to go there. Um, doesn't take that long today on a ferry, but uh, at that time it took uh, several hours. But it's it's doable. It's not like you know going going very far away. And when they arrive um, on, which is now Denmark, the land of the, the Danes. So we have Yeats and we have the Danes. Then there are Swedes also. <laughs> so Swedes and Yeats and Danes, these are the main tribes. And uh, Beowulf is a Yeat, he goes to help the Danes. And, um, and the threshold is there when they arrive and there's a guard saying, what are you here for with all that weaponry, all those arms? What are you going to be doing here? And they need to explain, and then they need to ask whether the king allows them to come, and so on. So um, that begins the transformation. There's some kind of helper. Typically, there can be a mentor. Like if you watched um, The Lord of the Rings, the mentor there is the wizard. Gandalf. Gandalf, yes, exactly. So he's the typical mythical mentor. And, um, and we find these uh, characters somewhere in, in these myths.
Tolkien, who wrote The Lord of the Rings, was fascinated by the myths that we are reading. He was fascinated, fascinated by Beowulf. He was fascinated by Icelandic sagas. And he was fascinated by the Kalevala, which is our last book that we read here. So there are challenges and temptations. There can be a helper. Then there's an abyss, death, and rebirth. You know, you go to a really scary place under the water or wherever, and we'll see other, other places. Uh, there's transformation, atonement, and return. So this is a little bit of simplified uh, hero's journey. And I do want to emphasize that not all the myths that we'll be reading, not all the stories we'll be reading, exemplify all of these. But this is kind of like good to keep in the background, background to map against what's going on against this, which Campbell actually felt that it was a pretty universal pattern of uh, myths and folklore. So um, I'm going to be posting this, and you could pick up that uh, handout where I've got the first. Can we finally get to the first 25 lines of Beowulf. This was kind of like your welcome to this course in the beginning of the semester. I put the That's the me. original manuscript uh, text. I'm going to turn myself uh, off. To the uh, welcome home page. There. OK. You have the handout. You don't need to be listening to me on a, on a, you know, on a PowerPoint. But it's there if you want to re-listen. And then, of course, uh, I don't know why the system automatically puts it on. And I'm not going to mess with it. So uh, you have the handout there. And this is uh, the, the, the first 25 lines of Beowulf and uh, with the translation. Of course, you've got the same, uh, same thing um, in Old English, the first 25 lines there on page number two on, on your books, and page number three gives a different translation, because there are multiple translations of the Beowulf poem. And I chose this one because uh, James Haney's translation reads pretty well. So it's not like a literal translation, sometimes really hard to find, map the word, OK, this is the old English word. You don't have to be engaged in that unless you are interested genuinely about old English. But that's not like part of the requirements of this course. So uh, we have the, we have the uh, English translation in your book. And I would like to invite one of you to read the the translation on page three, or begin it, and then you can probably change readers. So, uh, and then we'll read this translation, so you can see that they tell the same story, but in a little bit different words. Um, who is the book with? You've got the book, yes. Would you mind reading? Okay. Uh, so, just the first thing. So, yeah, so the spare days. So the spare days in the days gone by, and the kings who had ruled them had courage and greatness. We have heard those princes heroic kings. There was Shield. Shepson. Shepson, scourge of many tribes, a record of many benches, rampaging among foes. This terror of the hall troops had come far. A foundling to start with, he would flourish later on, as his powers waxed and work, has, work was put. Yeah. In the end, each man on the outlying coast beyond the little road had yielded to him and began to pay tribute. That was one good thing. Afterwards, a boy child was born to shield a bug in the yard of comfort sent by God to that nation. He knew what they had told him. Told. Uh, whatever that means. And, uh, the long times and troubles they come through, and the foul leader, Savor of Life, the glorious Almighty, who made this man renowned, Shield, had father a famous son. Bayo's name was known through the north. The young prince had been proved like that, giving freely while his father lived, so afterwards in the age when fighting starts. 
steadfast companion who will stand by him and who holds the line behavior that's admired is the path to power and the blood everywhere. Okay, wonderful. And now if I may ask somebody else to read from this, which starts by low, it's the same thing, and just read the first 25 lines. Or well, actually, you can stop after line 11. So, any volunteers, please? Well, we have heard of the glory of the people, kings of the spirit, things and days of the Lord, how the nobles perform deeds of the Lord, Oft, I think, should, should, shedding, shedding, or away the knee house, knee house, from the troops of the enemies. For many tribes terrified the warriors since he was first found for, for the, for that he experienced so was prospered under heaven's dragon honor until each of the neighboring peoples of the ocean had to listen to him to pay him tribute. He was a good king afterwards of son. You can actually stop there. Okay. We're not going to be reading, reading more. That's um, uh, in all English. So that's, that's the, these are the opening lines. And I noticed that students usually don't mind learning to read these in old English with this. Anyway, that's a little bit silly. But you notice that how these translations are different. And I hope that you will find uh, Shem Husseini's um, translation easy to read. Um, so that was the reason for my picking up this particular edition. This is not difficult either. But uh, like, for instance, on line four, um, Amy calls the the uh, older character now already because they give this like okay there were, were these important people in the old times before the time that the story then picks up so uh, Henny calls him Shield Shevson and in this other translation he's referred to as Shield Shaving so the same thing Shield is Shield. <laughs> But shield is old English, and shield has been translated into present-day English. You will notice these names are just phantasmagorical, um, and they very often they reflect the heroic world that was, uh, you know, the war. You have war-related names quite often. Okay, so uh, I'm going to post this PowerPoint uh, online, and uh, and that's where I read it there as well. Um, on that, on those uh, last um, slides, but I'll read it here in person. So I'll read the first uh, eleven lines to you, and then we'll practice together. So this gets into the mood. Quat we gardena in year dahun, teot kuninga trun ja trunan, huta ätelingas ellen fremedon. Oft shield shaving, shared in a freatum, mone hum maithum, neod setla of death, exode eras, sutan arest weart, fair shaft funden, hevas frobre ye bard, weox under volknum, weart mundum hotha, of that him eichwoch um sit and ra over horn rare, huran shoulder, pompan yildan. That was God feeling. So, so how does it sound? Weird? It is English, but it is English that is a foreign language to today's English speakers. So we need to, anyone who learns to understand this uh, has to study it separately, like you would study German or French or Arabic or whatever, another foreign language. So. Um, but isn't it weird in a way that there are, sometimes there are these words that sound totally familiar. And even a sentence where we finished here, that was God gooning. You can translate that. That was, 
a good king, right? So we've made kuning a little bit shorter, we just say king, but, uh, but uh, the other words, that is identical. Was, we pronounce it a little bit differently, was. God is today pronounced as good, but, uh, but we notice that these, uh, these, there are these uh, uh, correspondences. The first word is by uh, our book, it's translated by soul. In this translation, it's translated by love, uh, and it's read quat, and it's an interjection. And we have get that word, quat, it's today. Can anyone guess? What? What? Yes, it's like, what? <laughs> that's, that was an old English interjection. And that's how um, very often it's, it, it wouldn't translate as what today, because what is simply today, it is either a relative pronoun or interrogative pronoun. But quat was also an interjection in Old English. So uh, it, it opens this whole poem. And, uh, and do you mind uh, practicing to read this? Why not? Why not? So uh, let's take it in small pieces. Quat. Vegardena. In Yerdahum. Yerdahum. There's a weird uh, sound which we have unfortunately lost in the word on the first line, the last word, dahum. Uh, we spare games. You will you will find the word gar in many names, many names in the in the poem. So gar means spare, uh, you know, military, very. Uh, militaristic uh, names often. So garden are spear dames with dames, but we also carry these spears. So in Yerdahum means in the days, in the olden days, um, Yer is year, year days literally. And Dahum has that weird noise there at the G, letter G was pronounced as voice, we are fricative <laughs> linguistically, but we don't have that sound anymore. Um, so let's take this first line again. What we garden in year dahum? Wonderful. Okay. Theod Kuninga. Okay. Theod Kuninga. Yes, people, kings. Theod is people, and Kuninga is um, kings. Thrum jefrunon. Who is how? How? So it's the same word. Who tha atelingas? Ellen fremedon. How the nobles performed deeds of valor. So, um, oft is often. Uh, oft should shedding. Shedden of Reatum. Monecum Naitum. Meod Zetla of there. Exode Eorlas. Sutan arrest where So he was first found as an orphan. The founding. He thus propriabad. Works under Volknum. Grew up under the uh, clouds. Wealth mindum fah. Of that him. Of that him. I quote. 
Whom sit them down? It's like neighbors, neighboring people. Or their comrade? Who ran shoulder? So the neighboring people often uh, have to come to here or wanted to come to here over Han Rade, which is Whale Road. It's a nice metaphor for what is Whale Road. Ocean. Ocean, yes. Gomban Yildan. That was God Kuning. Yeah, well done. It's not that hard. And uh, and if you are into this kind of this kind of masochism, uh, you will have that PowerPoint then later on where I read it for you if you want to practice more more with it. Uh, this is not a, a gradable thing in this class at all. I'm not going to be grading you how well you read all the English. I give another class which is. Uh, the history of the English language, and there's a there's a gradable thing students learn to read this, and um, and uh, they uh, interestingly don't typically hate it. So, <laughs> but anyway, I just wanted to give you guys a taste of how it how it really sounded, and or or how how linguists hypothesize that it sounded, and of course you have to take into consideration that I am reading it as, um, as a non-native speaker of not only English, but also of all English, but if you read it, you read it with an American accent, I read it with my Finnish accent, so anyway, um, this class I don't typically teach on Tuesdays, Thursdays, so this class is supposed to end at 1.30. One twenty-five. Forty-five. Forty-five. Not forty-five. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, so we can. We still have time to cover, and we need to cover a lot of things. So let me just get rid of this. Okay. There's that obnoxious woman again. So let's get rid of her. reading when she's not invited to read aloud on the PowerPoint. So uh, the other handout that I gave to you is the names in some a selection of names in Bill, because this is uh, one of these things that uh, you will notice that when you're reading uh, reading a story from a different culture and a different time in a particular genre, this is the heroic genre. Uh, you will notice that the names are reflections of that particular genre. And especially in Beowulf, uh, you will find these, uh, these very interesting names. This is just a small selection of, um, of uh, the names with the translations. And the translations will give you an idea of the world view. Uh, what is wonderful about literature is that we can do time travel and uh, geographical travel. So we travel to different geographical places, and in, in the case of this class, we are traveling to the north, uh, northern Europe, we're traveling to Denmark, to, to parts of Sweden with the Icelandic sagas, we're traveling to Norway and Iceland. And with the Vikings, who are the, who are the protagonists of those sagas, we're traveling with them to England and to wherever they go. 
And uh, then uh, the final text that we will tackle in this class, the Kalevala, will take us to eastern parts of what is today's Finland and western parts of today's Russia. So we're going to be going to those areas. So, you know, we're going to be stomping around uh, mainly in Scandinavia and Finland. Finland is not like officially part of Scandinavia, but uh, but it's uh, what people call Finland, Scandia. So restricted uh, area geographically, but uh, all these all these writings they have been significant uh, for our culture. And we, we're still drawing from it. And what I want to emphasize, you know, when you do these readings and they seem so foreign and so far away, because we are going, like, you know, in, in case of Beowulf, we're going to about 700 to 1,000, and even, even beyond that, because those stories had lived uh, from about, you know, like maybe 500. Um, so we're really traveling far away back in time, doing time travel. Uh, but this is what we can do with literature. We can go to a place that we could not visit. We can geographically go to a lot of places um, once you know travel picks up again. Uh, but um, but uh, it's not practical very often. And at least it's very expensive to travel to all these foreign places. But you pick up a book, and you are instantaneously there in a foreign place, in a foreign time. And that's, that's the beauty of uh, literature. Um, I hope it didn't come out as a little sermon, but it's uh, supposed to be like motivational. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I, I just couldn't imagine life without being able to pick up a book and, and, and travel, now that we especially can travel. So the names, we've got Beowulf, that's the, that's the protagonist of our story. Uh, it's basically, it means be there, and wolf is wolf. So it's very transparent, but it's, it's more than just a translation of these two morphemes, Beowulf and wolf, be, be wolf. Uh, in, in the olden times, and, and still even today, if there's something really scary, you come up with a uh, circumlocution, uh, what we could call a euphemism for a, a scary thing, a taboo thing. In, the, in, the, in, Scan, in Scan, uh, Scandinavia, uh, bears were really scary, and uh, you did not want to want to refer to a bear with its name, so it was kind of like taboo. So it's like, you know, talk of the devil, and the devil, this devil, devil appears, that sort of a similar kind of a mentality. And um, so bears were often referred to with different kinds of circumlocutions, and bee wolf is the wolf of the bees, uh, is another circumlocution for bear. So that's our main guy. A glorious spear I spare I promise that Bar will be showing a lot in these um, in these names. So we have Hrotgar, which means glorious spear. Uh, another translation would be angry uh, spear if uh, if we see Hrot as meaning the same as wrath. So wrath spear. And of course you have to be angry in order to be a good soldier, so a warrior, so wrath and anger and uh, glory go often together. So Hrothgar was angry or a glorious spear. Um, number three is Hielak will be introduced to Hialak. Uh, sometimes we don't really know. Some of the old English uh, morphemes are kind of tra more transparent. It's either a soul gift, um, which would be a little bit of a different name, but sometimes these names are kind of like purposefully ambiguous, that it can also be thoughtless. He is thought, and luck can be less, so you're lacking thought. 
And this is the king who was a, a good person, but he didn't, he was not a good planner, so he got this name thoughtless. Um, could also be soul gift. <coughs> Hela was married to Heed, which is thoughtful, and so you know you have the thoughtless king and a, a thoughtful wife, so that's a good combination. So um, interesting. Um, well, well, there was uh, Rodgar's wife. Uh, it means a foreign slave or a captive. And that's in that world, wives were very often brought from trips abroad as captives, captive slaves, and uh, sometimes they were married. Freya was a watchful consort. Unferth is introduced to us toward the end of today's readings, and uh, that means unhardy. We love survivor of Warfare, Ashere, Army, Spare, uh, Eormen Ridge, Enormous, ru Ruler, Ridge is Ruler, Fred Ridge, Glorious, Ruler, or Angry Ruler. Edgedale was Beowulf's father, and he was the servant of the sword. Uh, edge there. Edge is uh, literally edge, like you know, we get that word, but it refers uh, like metonymously to the sword, which has an edge. So, servant of the edge, edge meaning sword in this case. Ergil's wealthy hostage, hostage of wealth. Breka, storm or breaker, uh, wave breaker, and we read about Beowulf and Breva um, having a swimming contest as young men. Hrodmund, a glorious hand. Swerting, dark, hued. Hildeburg, battle castle, a female name. Hrodulf, glorious wolf or angry wolf. Ochtere, army, terror, and Siemun, victorious hand. So this is just the selection, and the translations can have, there are, there's a possibility for other translations as well. But, uh, but it gives you an idea of the world of these people, that it's, uh, it's anger and glory and, and, uh, uh, and swords and, and spears, and um, that is uh, kind of you know, telling about this world. Uh, Gar, I have to tell you a very quick uh, personal story. One of my grandchildren's name is Edgar, and he's like, I hate my name. I don't like my name. I don't have another name. And we're just like, Edgar, you have such a noble name because Ed means noble. That's old English, and Gar is spear, so he's a noble spear. And once we explained that to him, he was a little bit happy. Anglo-Saxon name, but anyway, back to Beowulf. Uh, it's the you know the cultural influence of this. The fact that we still have little boys named Edgar's is that you know this this Anglo-Saxon cultural influence has been has been pretty you know pretty overwhelming sometimes. All right, so we start from. And would you mind turning the light on it's behind you there? So uh, in the uh, it's syllabus, I refer to the lines. So read these lines and these lines by, by, by this day. Um, it's not divided into chapters uh, directly. So. Uh, what is nice about this edition, though, is that in the, in the margins, you have kind of like a synopsis of what's going to be happening in this particular passage, in the next passages. So you get an idea. It's kind of like a short cut to, or, or an introduction of, OK, this is what's happening. So we start, the Danes have legends about their warrior kings. The most famous was Shield Shelfson 
who found, founded the ruling house. And this is the ruling house that is going to be, so we're going back in time. Like, remember how the, if, if you read the beginning of the Old Testament, how it begins, how, uh, you know, and then there was, and he begot him, and he's, this was the son of him, and then that they have these sons, and then they have these sons, and so on and so forth. It's just like this chronicle of list of names of people. And um, it's, it has, of course, historical significance. And in a lot of these, uh, these myths that you will be reading, it was important for people to know where they came from, what their ancestors, who their ancestors were. And especially, you know, we're talking about noble people here, you know, kings and, kings and, and, and warriors and so on. So uh, we start from Shilk Shaving, uh, and uh, this is not this is not uh, direct. Uh, Beowulf doesn't come directly from from Shilk Shaving. Um, so Shaving, or is the same as in your book, Shield. Just the translation of Shield. Um, Sheafson. Actually, you don't need this here. So let's just use what you all use. So this is the central central uh, person to introduce here. And um, so uh, Sheafson. Uh, these are Scandinavian last names. So you know what his name, his father's name was. If he is Sheaf's son, then his father must have been Sheaf. Yes. Um, you know, Erickson is the son of Eric, Johnson is the son of John, and so on. We, we have a lot of Scandinavian names in, uh, in our country still because of the, the, the flux of moving up. Do we have Olivia Jones? So we've got, you know, we've got, we see these people in, <laughs> in the rosters and so on. Okay, so uh, starting from this good king who is described here. And he had a son whose name was Beo or Beo, depending on the translation. In our translation, it's Beo. Uh, this is not our Beowulf. It was, it, it was just, uh, it was uh, another family, uh, known but um, uh, not the same. And a little bit away. like, you know, memorize this whole whole stuff, but it uh, it gives, it's going directly there, because we have half day here in the middle. Half day has four kids, so. Hell, yeah, I've done it. Or, as your book, I think they just, um, Translated to half Dane. Half Dane is a person who was half Danish and half something else. Half Dane. And half Dane had four sons. And I'm going to continue here. So we had Herogod, another spear. And second son, Hrothgar, the Spear of Wrath. And the third son was Halva. And then there was a girl who, whose name is not given because she was a girl. So we are living in a very patriarchal uh, society. So these, are, these four are all half Danes, uh, half Danes uh, children. 
and who becomes a key person in Beowulf is Hrokka, because Hrokka is the one who uh, has, is the king of the Danes, whom Beowulf goes to help because his father, Beowulf's father, has known Hrokka when he was um, young, and, and uh, that is, that's the connection. Uh, interestingly, about you know, just a, a few words about the, the culture. So this girl whose name is not given, it probably started with an H as well. But uh, but it, it's mentioned that she married. Uh, she was she was the queen uh, of uh, the Swedish warrior whose name was Onela, and that was Swede. So she married well, that was worth mentioning in the story. So this is kind of like uh, important because you start from Shiel Shevson, who is the good king on line 11 in the opening lines of Bill. That was thought Kuni, and that gives kind of like sets the stage, what is a characteristic of a good king? And you, you'll notice that there are a lot of these characteristics that are expected of a good ki king. Uh, has to be, of course, brave, but has to be also good in the, in the sense that not a the, not the bad person. And there's, you, you refer to these people like they were ring givers. Like what in the world does ring giving mean? What does it mean? You give treasures to your soldiers who have served you well. And so they give all kinds of, you see that there are all these treasures that, that people give to their servants and the soldiers who have served them. Okay, um, so if you turn, if you have your books with you, if you turn to line 80, this is on page seven, and we first, uh, so we first have have uh, this kind of like historical overview, and then uh, then we are brought from Shield Shevson Shevson to Hrothgar, uh, Hrothgar's time. So Hrothgar uh, was Shield Shevson's great, exactly. So. Shield was Hrothgar's great grandfather. All right, and here we have Hrothgar, who is the Danish king. And uh, he decides to build something. What does he build? He built a mead hall, and that is a mead hall that hasn't, of, of which kind hasn't ever been seen before, because it's so huge, and it's so glorious. And there is, in Denmark, there actually still today is a place which is said to have been the place of Hrothgar's mead hall, and it has a name. It's not just, you know, any hall. It is called Herop, right? Herop Hall. And what does the Herop then mean? Herop comes from the word heart. Not heart, which is the you know, organ, but uh, heart, uh, a male deer, a buck. So that's behind that name. It's kind of a beautiful, beautiful name for the hall. And uh, this becomes the center place of, if you remember that equilibrium stage of Campbell's a Hero's Journey. That's the place where things are well. This is a wonderful, wonderful place where people, people get together after their daily work and adventures and they 
get together to have food, get together to have wine, get together to have that mead, which is, which is uh, very stereotypical for, um, for these times uh, and, um, and still white. So here also we, we end up at this place which, and everything is great and, uh, and Hrokkar is a good, a good king like his great grandfather was. But if you look at page 7 and line 80, nor did he renegade, but doled out rings, you know, he was a good king, he doled out rings, and torques at the table. The hall towered its gables wide and high, and awaiting a barber's burning. That doom abided, but in time it would come. The killer instinct unleashed among in-laws, the blood lust rampant. And here we have this ominous reference to what's going to happen. So this equilibrium, this happy stage, the status quo is not going to last forever. Things will change and things will become horrible. And then we need Beowulf, and Beowulf then can be kind of like mapped together with the Christian poet's um, idea of who may come to help uh, when things are really bad. Okay, thanks for uh, coming here and next time. Love for the class and uh, have a good rest of the week.